Let's pray. Lord, it's good to be in your house. And it's good to settle our hearts in the middle of the week and to turn to you. Lord, it's so easy to get our eyes fixed on the things here horizontally, but we need to look up vertically and be reminded that you are on the throne. And when we become weary in this world, Lord, revive us and strengthen us, we pray. And so tonight, as we look into your word, speak to our hearts, minister to our souls, as we drink in your word tonight, in your presence, in your house. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. We are here in Judges chapter 9, where we left off from last week. Let me just summarize where we've been, and then I'm going to actually read a few verses at the end of chapter 8 so we can kind of get a running start. Uh, Gideon has been serving as the fifth judge of Israel. He is the one who gets the most press coverage in the Bible among all of the judges. And um, Gideon because of his leadership as a judge, and again, the judges for which this particular book is named, uh, simply means a military leader at this particular time. Uh, he has served well, he's been used by God, and as a result um, of being used by God, and with, of course, God's lead, uh, Gideon successfully with the Israeli army defeated the Midianites, and it has resulted in, chapter 8 says, 40 years of peace. And so the people of Israel have been enjoying 40 years of peace under Gideon's leadership. Now, Gideon had many strengths, but he had one particular weakness. He had a weakness for women. That is not unique to his story. That's, the, that's the, unfortunately the tragic story of uh, a lot of people. We're going to see when we get to Samson as the last of the 12 judges mentioned in the book of Judges. He particularly has a weakness for women. But the Bible says that Gideon, at the end of chapter 8, Gideon had many wives. It doesn't say how many, it just says many, which means there were many battles over the thermostat in his house. That's what that means. It also means he had zero clients closet space. That's what it means. So he had many wives, and he also had a concubine. And as a result of his relationship with many wives and a concubine, he had 70 sons. Okay, so this is, a, this is an area of Gideon's life where he did not really have that much self-control. He really wasn't walking with the Lord in that regard. Um, and one of the sons that he has among the 70 the one son that was born to his relationship with his concubine was a son named Abimelech. Abimelech from two Hebrew words, Abba, father, Melech, um, king. And so Abimelech's name means my father is king. You know, you got to have a little bit of an ego if you're going to name your kid, my father is king. So that's the way Gideon thought of himself, even though he didn't really position himself as king over Israel. But this son who bears that name will, in fact, do that. That's what chapter 9 is all about, that we're about to read. Gideon's son, Abimelech, born to him by this concubine, because of the vacuum of leadership that is created upon his father Gideon's death, Abimelech will assert himself as the king of Israel. This isn't even the monarchy yet. This isn't even the time of Israel's history. He's going to be crowned the first king of Israel. Now, I know when we think of the monarchy and we think of the list of the kings of Israel, when you, if you know your Bibles and you know biblical history, Saul was the, the first king of Israel. But Abimelech is actually going to be crowned king as the first king ever crowned in Israel. It's an illegitimate reign. But nevertheless, he's actually going to be crowned here in a moment as the first king of Israel. God doesn't recognize it. The people do. Again, it's an illegitimate reign, but he's crowned as the first king of Israel in their history. So that's the backstory. Let me read the last few verses of chapter 8 so we can get a running start into chapter 9. If you'll look there with me, uh, verse 33, it says, So it was as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel again played the harlot 
They prostituted themselves, in other words, with the Baals. Now, the Baals are the false gods of their uh, neighboring nations that were pagan nations. So they, Israel starts to worship these false gods. They played the harlot. They prostitute themselves with the Baals and made Baal Berith, which literally means Lord of the Covenant, their God. Okay, not the God of, of Israel, not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They make this false God, Baal Berith, their God. Thus, the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the house of Jeroboam, that's Gideon, in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. So you're familiar with this cycle of sin in the book of Judges. And so what we find now after 40 years of peace, as a result of Gideon's leadership, the people after his death begin to resort to their old ways. They forsake the Lord their God. They forget the God who's given them victory and peace. The very reason they have rest from all their enemies is because of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How quickly they have forgotten him. They forsake him and they start to worship the Baals. The principal God, Baal Barith, this Lord, small L, Lord of the covenant. They start to worship this false God. And so they are now, I'll just circle it, they're at this stage again and in this cycle, they fall into sin and idolatry. And so now as we look into chapter 9, here comes Abimelech because he sees this as an opportune time for him to capitalize upon, to assert himself in the leadership role that his father has left since his father has died. But, you know, it was always God's prerogative to appear to someone, to tap them on the shoulder, to raise them up as the next judge. This is not, you know, Abimelech's right to do such a thing. And we're going to see here, he's an evil guy. It's all about self-promotion. He's going to kill people who get in his way. That's how he He's going to secure the throne. So he's a brutal guy, as we're going to see here in a minute. But look at chapter 9 with me, verse 1. It says, Then Abimelech, that's the son born to Gideon by this concubine. Then Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, that's another name for Gideon, went to Shechem to his mother's brothers and spoke with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's fathers, saying, Please speak in the hearing of all the men of Shechem. Which is better for you, that all 70 of the sons of Jeroboam of Gideon reign over you, or that one reign over you? Remember that I am your own flesh and bone. Okay, so he goes to Shechem. This is where his mother was from. We find out back in chapter 8 that when Gideon had this relationship with this concubine, he's having this adulterous affair. Uh, she is from Shechem. This child is born to that relationship, Abimelech. He goes back to Shechem and he, and he appeals to his uncles, his mother's brothers. And he says to all his uncles who are probably influential in the, in the town of Shechem, you know, listen, uh, Gideon is dead. My dad is dead. Uh, he's got 70 sons. I'm one of them. Uh, but I'm the only one who's really your flesh and blood because I've come from Shechem. And so I'm one of you, right? And so because you're one of me and we're in the same hood, you need to support me. And I need to be your next leader because you don't want 70 guys who are my like, you know, half brothers. You don't want them, the other 69 guys to be ruling over you. If, if you have the opportunity to have somebody to rule over you, wouldn't you want it to be somebody who's from among your own clan, among your own people? And they buy into this. Keep reading verse three. And his mother's brothers spoke all these words concerning him in the hearing of all the men of Shechem. And their heart was inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, he is our brother. So they gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Berith, with which Abimelech hired, notice this, worthless and reckless men, and they followed him. Okay, now, 70 shekels, they give him some startup money. They're, so they take up this little, you know, collection there at Shechem. They're like, okay, Abimelech, you're our leader, you're our hero. So we're going to give you some startup money so you can, you know, gather together a band of men, some ragtag army, and start to take leadership of our nation. They gather together 70 shekels. Now, remember last week we talked about how Gideon, back in chapter 8, he had received an offering from all of his soldiers who had taken earrings off of the Midianites, and it amounted to... Uh, 1,700 shekels of gold. And we talked about how in modern terms, 
In modern dollars, that would be the equivalent of 1.3 million, because we're talking about gold and shekels. It amounted about 43 pounds of gold. So in today's dollar, it'd be about 1.3 million dollars. Here, it's not gold; it's silver, and it's not 1,700 shekels; it's 70. So based on the, and I did this calculation multiple times today. I'm like, really? Is this all it was? The dollar equivalent today would be 700 bucks. That's it. Dollar equivalent today. So think about how are you going to hire a group of people and you got to spread $700 among them. So let's just say, it doesn't say the number. Let's just say he gathered 70 guys. He's paying them 10 bucks each. 10 bucks each. Hey, you know, but that's what you get when you're going to get worthless and reckless guys, right? Those are the words that are used here. These are worthless and reckless guys. Now, some translations, literally, the King James says, um, light and vain, light and vain guys. So, these are lightweights, they're vain, and, um, and the Hebrew for light uh, is pachaz, it means unimportant. The Hebrew for vain is rake, and it means empty. These are unimportant, empty guys. They're like, yeah, for 10 bucks, okay. All right, we'll come. All right, what you, what you got? I got you 10 bucks, that's all I got. All right, all right. So they, they leave their video games and their moonshine, and they're like, all right, we'll be your ragtag army for 10 bucks each. And so here, here they go. But it gets bloody here. I mean, it gets horrible here. Look what happens. He takes this bunch of guys that he's just hired for the equivalent of $700 in today's dollars. Verse 5, and then he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the 70 sons of Jeroboam, on one stone. Like they gather up all 70. Now we're going to see in a minute that one of them escapes. And so, and Abimelech is one of them. So, 68. He's going to take 68 of his half-brothers. And there's apparently some big stone there. And he just, you know, brings them out one by one, probably beheads them, just slaughters them on the stone, one by one, kills them all. This is how he secures the throne. So, you get the picture of what kind of a guy he is. The next sentence, but Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left because he had hid himself. And all the men of Shechem gathered together, all of Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king beside the terebinth tree at the pillar that was in Shechem. Okay, so he's the first king crowned in Israel. Again, an illegitimate reign. But nevertheless, he's asserted himself. And how did he assert himself? By killing all the opposition. And this is the kind of guy that he is. This is the kind of leader now that Israel has. And how have they gotten to this place? Because what we read earlier at the end of chapter 8, they began to prostitute themselves and worship other gods. And when you don't have God central to your life, you're going to do all kinds of crazy, wicked things. I mean, that's just that's just fact for every single one of us. That's a takeaway for every single one of us. When you don't keep God central to your life, you're going to end up doing crazy, sinful things. And this is what happens. See, because when we remove God, then we have no moral compass. And when you have no moral compass, then you think you are the judge and arbiter of everything. And then you start doing things that are the result of our base sinful nature. So that's why every single one of us needs God as our moral compass. We need to constantly be, you know, having the Holy Spirit check us and say, this is right, this is wrong, say this, don't say that, do this, don't do that. Because, you know, we are dependent upon the constant guidance of the Holy Spirit to do what is right, because left to ourselves, we will always do what is wrong. Does everybody get that? I mean, that's, that's reality of human nature. Left to ourselves, we will always do wrong But if we constantly are surrendering to God and submitting to Him, then there's more hope for us to do what is right. So Abimelech is this guy, he has no room for God, and the nation now has departed from worshiping God. They're worshiping idols. This is the result of what they get. Now, what is ironic here is that it says, let me read again verse 6, And all the men of Shechem gathered together, uh, all of Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king beside the terebinth tree at the pillar that was in Shechem. At the pillar 
the pillar, what kind of a pillar was at Shechem? W would you leave the book of Judges and just hang a left a little bit and go to the last chapter of Joshua? Would you go back to Joshua chapter 24? And I want, you show, I want to show you what the pillar is because there's some tragic irony in what is happening. So while you're turning to the left there to find Joshua chapter 24, the, the location is Shechem. The men of Shechem have made Abimelech king. This is all in defiance of God. This has all been the result of a massacre of 68 sons of Gideon. And they're doing all of this. They're crowning Abimelech at this tree in Shechem where there's a pillar. So here's what we find out about the pillar. Back at the end of Joshua chapter 24... Look at verse 23. Now, this is Joshua speaking. This is before Joshua dies. He's been the leader of, of Israel. He inherited the leadership role from Moses. It was God's appointment. And these are some of his parting words that he says to the Israelites. Now, this is Joshua 24, verse 23. Now, therefore, he said, put away the foreign gods which are among you and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God, we will serve and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute, not a statute, okay? This is a law and an ordinance in where? Shechem, okay? Next verse, then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and he took a large stone, here's the pillar, and set it up there under the oak this is the terebinth tree that was, in, that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, behold, this stone, this pillar here, will be a witness to us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. It shall therefore be a witness to you, lest you deny your God. And so Joshua let the people depart each to his own inheritance. Your attention where they have just crowned Abimelech and made him this unrighteous king by their own evil design following the slaughter of all of Gideon's sons happened at the very location where Joshua set up this stone as a witness against them that they should never depart from the word of God. This is tragic irony. I almost envision, there's this pillar, I almost envision them kind of like leaning on it, leaning on the very thing that was supposed to be a reminder to them. You better follow God. You better follow his word. You better obey everything that God says. And they're leaning on it like, yeah, Abimelech, that was a good move. You know, you slaughtered all those, you know, those children of Gideon, and now it's time for us to crown you king. Like such defiance and disregard for the standard of God. And they're making this guy king in the shadow of the very thing that was supposed to remind them, do not, do not depart from the law of God or it will be to your own peril. And this is what they're doing. This is the scene now back here in, in Judges chapter 9. You can turn back there. So it's just, it's very sad here because what we realize is they did, they did not read nor did they heed the word of God. They did not read it nor did they heed it because here they are denying the Word of God and defying the Word of God. And the further you stray from God and His Word, the more your human nature will rule the day. And it's, it's a terrible thing. And so, keep reading verse 7. Now, when they told Jotham, okay, remember Jotham, he was the youngest son of Gideon who escaped the slaughter. So, he, you know, he took off, he ran, he hid. And when they told Jotham, he went and stood on top of Mount Gerizim and lifted his voice and cried out and he said to them. Okay, now, you remember uh, Mount Gerizim? Because that was also back in the book of Joshua. And before that, it was in the book of Deuteronomy. There were two mountains in Israel. They're still there today, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. And what Moses instructed in Deuteronomy 7 
transpired in Joshua chapter 8. In Deuteronomy 27, Moses said, when you guys get to the promised land, I want you to divide the Israelites in half, and I want half of the Israelites to stand on Mount Gerizim and read the blessings if you obey the Word of God. Here's what's going to happen in your life if you obey God's Word. The other half of the Israelites stand on Mount Ebal. They're right next to each other with Shechem in the middle, a little valley in the middle. And, and those standing on Mount Ebal are to read the curses. Here's what's going to happen if you disobey the Word of God. So Gerizim and Ebal. And so Jotham takes to Mount Gerizim, the very place that they remember the law of God was read and all the blessings of God. And he gives this warning. Now, you know, this is a brave guy because he, you know, he hightailed it out of there when he saw Abimelech slaughtering all of his brothers. But now he shows up on Mount Gerizim. He's a little emboldened here. And he is going to, you know, recite this parable that comes from his heart. You know, so, I don't know, maybe it was a rap. I don't know, you know, but here, he's on Mount Gerizim rapping. But here's, here's what it is. And he said to them, listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The trees once went forth to anoint a king over them. And they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, should I cease giving my oil with which they honor God and men and go to sway over trees? And then the tree said to the fig tree, you come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, should I cease my sweetness and my good fruit and go to sway over trees? And then the tree said to the vine, you come and reign over us. But the vine said to them, should I cease my new vine, my new wine, which cheers both God and men and go to sway over trees? Okay, your attention for a second. So he's, you know, reciting this kind of parable thing to the men of Shechem. And what, what we find out is this, it's going to be this confrontational, basically a rebuke that he puts kind of in a poetic way as a parable. And he says there are three, I mean, a vine is not really a tree, but, but there are three trees. There, there are three, um, you know, uh, two trees and, and a vine. And these are noble things. You know, you have an olive tree, you have a fig tree, and you have a vine that produces grapes and produces wine. And so, and he puts it in these parable terms. He goes, you know, the trees ask the olive tree, would you rule over us? And the olive tree is like, no, 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 no. I, I'm not going to do that. That's not my role. That's not my place. What about the fig tree? No, 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 that's not my place. I've got fruit to produce. What about the vine? No, 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 no that's not my place. I, I don't want to do this. So it's pictures of, of people who um, are refusing. They're reluctant to, to reign over the people. But now he, he switches in the parable and he, and he moves on to a bramble or some of your translations say a thorn bush. And this is a picture of Abimelech, okay? In verse 14, he says, Then all the trees said to the bramble, or the thorn bush, You come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, If in truth you anoint me as king over you, then come and take shelter in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. And so this thorn bush or this bramble, you know, he's using these parable terms. It's a picture of Abimelech. Everybody knows what he's saying here. He's like, you know, the righteous, the righteous trees wouldn't have anything to do with trying to reign and rule over people. That's God's choice. But there's this one thorn bush among us, and he's asserted himself as king, and he's, he's happy to be your king, which is ironic in the sense because he says that the thorn bush says, why don't you come and, and get shade underneath me? Well, there's no shade under a thorn bush. And so, you know, it's all irony in the language here. And, and he says, but you know what? He says, this is who you want? Let, let fire come out of this thorn bush and devour the cedars of Lebanon, all the rest of you. And so he gives this, it's just like rebuke in parable poetic terms. And then he goes on to say, now, therefore, if you have acted in truth and sincerity in making Abimelech king, which, this is sarcasm, he knows that they haven't. And if you have dealt well with Jeroboam, Gideon, and his house, which they haven't, they've slaughtered all the sons, and have done to him as he deserves, for my father fought for you. Okay, now he interjects, this is truth here. My father fought for you. He risked his life and he delivered you out of the hand of Midian. But you have risen up against my father's house this day and killed his 70 sons on one stone and made Abimelech, the son of his female servant, king over the men of Shechem because he is your brother. And then he goes back and he goes, if, if you've acted in truth and sincerity, I mean, if you guys really are, you know, know what you're doing here with Jeroboam, with Gideon and his house, this day, then rejoice. You know, be happy in Abimelech and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, 
Let fire come from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and Beth Milo, and let fire come from the men of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. And then notice, and Jotham ran away and fled. <laughs> and he went to beer because he needed some after that speech. <laughs> and, uh, and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. So, you know, he's emboldened for the moment. Like he goes up on Mount Gerizim. He's like, let me tell you this little poem. You know, you guys get the poem? Abimelech is the thorn bush. What are you guys doing? I mean, if you're really sincere about this, and if you've done well by my father, then okay, you know what you're doing. But if you don't, then may Abimelech strike you with fire. May you strike him with fire. I hope you guys turn on each other and devour each other. Bye. And he hightails it out. <laughs> and, he, and he runs. And this is the last that we hear of that guy, too. And so, verse 22, after Abimelech had reigned over Israel three years, I mean, it just went on for three years, God sent a spirit of ill will between Abimelech and the men of Shechem, and the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech, that the crime done to the 70 sons of Jeroboam might be settled and their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother who killed them, and on the men of Shechem who added him in the killing of his brothers. Now, can I just interject at this point? You know, look, God allowed him to reign for three years. Again, God was not in favor of it. God did not appoint Abimelech. It was an illegitimate reign. But you can sometimes wonder, why did God allow him to get away with it, like even for three years? But in God's timing, He will bring justice where justice is needed. Most of the time that we feel like injustices have been committed against us, we think God is slow in dealing with people who have done wrong against us. But God in His timing will deal with people when He needs to and how He needs to. And that part is up to Him. Three years he allows to go by here. I don't know. You know, maybe God was hoping that Abimelech would turn and repent. Um, whatever God's reason is, God's timing is always his prerogative. But he is going to turn them on each other here. And, and Abimelech is going to come to a tragic end. Let me see if, if we can hopefully get to the end of this chapter before we have to go. But, but here it goes. So, verse 25, And the men of Shechem set men in ambush against him on the tops of the mountains, and they robbed all who passed by them along that way, and it was told Abimelech. Okay, so basically what this is in modern terms, we would call this economic sanctions. What, what the men of Shechem are doing is they're interrupting the trade route. Abimelech is gathering wealth and fame because of his role and there are people who are scared of him. So this trade route is coming along. And what this verse is telling us is that the men of Shechem interrupted the trade route. They started robbing the, the people who were trading before they could get to Abimelech. So this is like economic sanctions against Abimelech. Before they, you know, really deal with Abimelech, they're like, well, we're just going to cut off some of his financial supply, you know, by, you know, interrupting the trade route. And we're going to steal all the money that's coming through the trade. And that's going to hurt him a little bit. Well, verse, verse 20 uh, Six. Now Gael, Gaal, the son of Abed, came with his brothers and went over to Shechem, and the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. So now there's internal struggles here. And so they went out into the fields and gathered grapes from their vineyards and trod them and made merry. They're, get, they're getting drunk here on the wine. And they went into the house of their God, because they're still in idolatry, and ate and drank and cursed Abimelech. Okay, so the tide is turning against Abimelech here. And then Gaal, the son of Abed, said, Who is Abimelech and who is Shechem that we should serve him? Is he not the son of Jeroboam and is not Zebul his officer? Serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem. But why should we serve him? If only this people were under my authority... Then I would remove Abimelech. So he said to Abimelech, increase your army and come out. So now this is, you know, he's taunting. So Gaal now is asserting himself. He's like, and says to the men of Shechem, we don't really like Abimelech anymore. I should be your king. And so he taunts Abimelech, come and fight us, come and fight us. Not a good thing after you've been drinking, by the way. Okay, not a good thing. But it says in verse 30, verse 30 that when... Zabul, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gaal, the son of Abed. His anger was aroused. We're going to see his anger is aroused at Gaal. He's loyal to Abimelech. And he sent messengers to Abimelech secretly saying, take note, 
Gaal, the son of Abed and his brothers have come to Shechem, and here they are fortifying the city against you. Now therefore get up by night, you and the people who are with you, and lie in wait in the field. And it shall be, as soon as the sun is up in the morning, that you shall rise early and rush upon the city. And when he and the people who are with him come out against you, you may then do to them as you find opportunity. And so Abimelech and all the people who were with him rose by night, and lay in wait against Shechem in four companies. Now, isn't this interesting? The very people who crowned him, he's now going to war against. So there's all this internal fighting because God has sent this spirit of ill will. You know, he, God is allowing some kind of demonic influence here to come in between them, to stir up this conflict. And so here comes Abimelech lying in wait, verse 35, and when Gaal the son of Abed went out and stood in the entrance to the city gate, because he doesn't know that the battle is about to happen, Abimelech and the people who were with him rose from lying in wait. And when Gaal saw the people, he said to Zebul, who's the city leader, look, people are coming down from the tops of the mountains. But Zebul said to him, you see the shadows of the mountains as if they were men. Like, you know, he's playing with them. Like, oh, I don't think those are soldiers. Well, he's already tipped off Abimelech. So, of course, he knows they're soldiers. And so, Gaal spoke again and said, see, people are coming down from the center of the land. And another company is coming from the diviner's terebinth tree. And then Zebul said to him, where indeed is your mouth now? with which you said, who is Abimelech, that we should serve him? Are not these the people whom you despise? Go out, if you will, and fight with them now. And so, Zabel is saying to him, tough guy, huh? You're a tough guy. You were doing all that tough talk, you know, and now that Abimelech and his army is coming against you, not so tough anymore, are you? And so, there's going to be war here. Gaal. In verse 39, Gaal went out leading the men of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. And Abimelech chased him and he fled from him and many fell wounded to the very entrance of the gate. And then Abimelech dwelt at Aruma, and Zabel drove out Gaal and his brothers so that they would not dwell in Shechem. So, you know, the, the attempted coup here is, is put out. And it came about on the next day that the people went out into the field and they told Abimelech. And so he took his people, divided them into three companies, and lay in wait in the field. And he looked, and there were the people coming out of the city. And he rose against them and attacked them. He's killing his own people. And then Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood at the entrance of the gate of the city. And the other two companies rushed upon all who were in the fields and killed them. So Abimelech fought against the city all that day. This is Shechem. He took the city and killed the people who were in it, and he demolished the city and sowed it with salt. That was a way that they would, you know, cleanse a ground and make sure nothing else grew there. And, and, you know, you have putrefying bodies. And so the salt is, you know, supposed to deal with, with that whole mess. Look, again, this guy is so power hungry that he's killing his own people to retain his leadership role. And Shechem would not be rebuilt until the reign of Jeroboam the first who was king over Israel for a time, and it would be almost two centuries later. So Shechem is going to lie just desolate under this salt for almost 200 years. It says, keep reading, verse 46, Now when all the men of the tower of Shechem had heard that, they entered the stronghold of the temple of the god Bereth. And it was told Abimelech that all the men of the tower of Shechem were gathered there together. And then Abimelech went up to Mount Zalman, he and all the people who were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bow from the trees and took it and laid it on his shoulder. And then he said to the people who were with him, what you have seen me do, make haste and do as I have done. And so each of the people likewise cut down his own bow and followed Abimelech and put them against the stronghold and set the stronghold on fire above them so that all the people of the tower of Shechem died 
died, about a thousand men and women. Okay, so you get the picture that, you know, after he conquers the city, there's still this one tower that is standing. About a thousand men and women find, you know, refuge in this tower. And Abimelech says, well, we're going to take the tower down. And he goes up on the hill and with his band of, of an army, and he says, all right, cut down these, you know, limbs like I'm doing, carry them all back. And they basically make a bonfire underneath the tower. They light it on fire and they smoke them all out and they kill them as a result of the fire. So about a thousand died that day. And so now they're done. And it says, and then Abimelech went to Thebes. You know, he's, now he's, now he's, he's got this hunger now to, to continue to do this. So now he went to Thebes and he encamped against Thebes and took it. But there was a strong tower in the city and all the men and women, all the people of the city fled there and shut themselves in. And then they went up to the top of the tower. So Abimelech came as far as the tower and fought against it. And he drew near the door of the tower to burn it with fire. Okay, he's trying the same thing. But now look at this. But a certain woman dropped an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. So you got the picture like there, the, the, this people in the town of Thebes, they're all up in this tower and Abimelech's going to do the same thing he did in Shechem. He's getting ready to light a bonfire. He's down below laying all the, the sticks and stuff. And this woman looks out the window and she's like, well, I'm going to take care of that guy. And she, she heaves a millstone. We don't know how big it is, but you know, she, it usually, those are the things that, you know, that donkeys would, would turn. They'd be harnessed to a millstone and, and donkeys would, would go in a circle around another stone that this that the millstone would lay on top of to to crush wheat or to, to press olives one or the other and she she hauls a whole millstone however big it is and she manages to roll it out the window and down onto Abimelech it goes and it crushes his skull now it doesn't kill him not yet because look look what he says it says, then he called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer and said to him draw your sword and kill me lest lest men say of me a woman killed me I <laughs> I can't die like this. Like, I mean, I'm a soldier. I've been killing a bunch of people. And now uh, you know, what, what's going to be written on my tomb, tombstone? You know, a woman killed me. So I, that, that can't happen. You know, I'm too tough for that. So kill me, he says to his armor bearer. You kill me. And so his young man thrust him through and he died. There you go. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man to his place. Okay, he's dead. Let's just go home. That's what happens. <laughs> Do you ever get the picture here throughout this historical record that whenever a leader died, the people were just like helpless. And so it would rise and fall on leadership, which is, you know, often still the case, which is why you have to make sure, you know, there are good leaders because a lot of things rise and fall on leaders. Now, you know, as followers of Christ, we should always, everything just only rises on Christ and everything should be built on Christ. You know, when human vessels get involved, they're frail, they're sinful, sometimes they're corrupt, sometimes they're righteous, sometimes they, they honor God and sometimes not. And, but it's a terrible thing for you to base your life on a human leader because as leaders come and go, they rise, they fall, they, um, they you know, are, are people who do well and then other times they don't do well. That's what you see happening here. Our leader's dead, let's go home, they're helpless. And verse 56 says, and thus God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech, which he had done to his father by killing his 70 brothers. You know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And all the evil of the men of Shechem, God returned on their own heads. And on them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. What that young guy had said on Mount Gerizim came to pass with these guys here. And so... God is going to raise up more judges. We'll get to that next week in chapter 10. You see the first, the first two are mentioned right there. The first guy only gets two verses. The next guy gets three verses. So these are not very well-known guys, but we'll talk more as we get into chapter 10, Lord willing, next week. But for tonight, let's pause it there. Lord, thank you for your word. And reminders to us that when we stray from you, when we're left to ourselves, it gets ugly and sinful. And so, Lord, we pray that we would constantly be searching your heart so that we wouldn't rely on ourselves. It's a dangerous thing when we rely on ourselves. Abimelech is a picture of all of us, really, in different ways. Left to ourselves, we will do pretty sinful, crazy things. And as far as it goes, Lord, concerning offenses and things that have happened when we've been wronged from time to time, 
Help us not to take matters into our own hands, that you, you are the one who will bring about justice in your time. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So may we never try to resolve things in our own anger or, our, or take things into our own hands, but may we just trust you. You in time will bring justice to every injustice in our world. In the meantime, may we just press into you and follow you with all our hearts. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you for this time together in your word. Be with us now as we go home. Bring us back together again on Sunday. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.